So my name is Lauren Selwood and I'm a solicitor in the employment team. Um, I'll be presenting today's webinar alongside Ruth Epps, who's a HR consultant with Bracia's sister company in Kent HR. So in today's session, we'll be giving you a whistle-stop tour on mental well-being in the workplace, and that's including a brief overview of the legal requirements um, an employer has in respect of mental health and well-being, some practical tips and ideas to support good mental health in the workplace, what to consider if an employee is suffering with poor mental health and well-being, and some potential risks if employers get it wrong. Um, throughout, please feel free to pop any questions you have um, in the questions box, and if we do have time at the end, we'll do our best to answer them. So I thought we'd kick off just firstly with some statistics. So information from Mental Health First Aid England, the MHFA, shows that at any one time, one in six people in the working age population of Britain experience symptoms associated with poor mental health. And in a study, almost half of employees, 46%, say that they've worked in recent months despite not feeling physically or mentally well enough to perform their duties. One third of employees expect or would like more support for their mental health and well-being from their employers. And mental ill health costs UK employers approximately £56 billion per year. And for every £1 spent by employers on mental health interventions, employers could get back £5.30 in reduced absence, presenteeism and staff turnover. And 81% of workplaces have increased their focus on employee mental health, which is a really good sign. However, 36% of companies take more reactive approach to implementing support for employees rather than being proactive. So it is clear that poor mental health and well-being can have a huge impact on businesses and some of those negative impacts could include extra cost, reduction in customer satisfaction, having to find, train and pay for temporary cover, especially in relation to any long-term sickness absence, a loss of morale and or motivation from other employees, reduced productivity and increased sickness absence across the workforce. And poor mental health cannot always be avoided. However, there are things that can be done to help manage it. And obviously we hope to try and give you some practical tips and ideas today. So firstly, why do employers have obligations concerning the mental health of their employees? Well, employers have a number of duties, including an implied and common law duty of care, an implied duty of trust and confidence, an implied duty of fidelity, and legal duty in relation to health and safety law, i.e. the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and any associated regulations. So the duty of care places an obligation on an employer to do all they reasonably can to protect their employees' health, safety and well-being at work. And this includes mental health, which must be treated as equally important as physical health. And in the case of Walker against Northumberland County Council in 1995, the court confirmed that there is no logical reason why the risk of psychiatric damage should be excluded from the scope of an employer's duty to provide the employee with a reasonable safe system of work and to take reasonable steps to protect them from risks which are reasonably foreseeable. So complying with a duty of care could include a number of things, perhaps providing a safe working environment, carrying out risk assessments and taking action if needed, taking all reasonable steps to protect employees from bullying and discrimination, and taking steps to help prevent work-related stress. So the duty of trust and confidence is a mutual duty. It requires employers and employees to behave in a way that means they can trust each other, treat each other with respect, and not behave in an entirely unreasonable way. It could therefore be argued that if an employee who is suffering with poor mental health is not treated with respect or is treated unreasonably, for example, requests for support being refused or having their poor mental health brushed under the carpet and ignored, that could potentially lead to a breach of mutual trust and confidence. So an employer who fails to meet their duties with an employee who is suffering with poor mental health or otherwise could find themselves at risk of a potential claim. And we will touch upon the claims that an employee could potentially bring a bit later on in the webinar. So before we move on, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that there are some specific rules regarding bereavement. So most people will experience the death of a person close to them during their working lives, and grief can affect someone in several ways, including poor mental health. 
So employers must be sensitive to what each employee might need at the time, consider their physical and emotional well-being, and this includes once they've returned to work, and recognise that grief affects everybody differently. Anyone who is legally classed as an employee has the right to time off if a dependent dies or their child is stillborn, or if they die under the age of 18. A dependent could include a husband, a wife, a civil partner or a parent. The law does not specify how much time off can be taken by an employee if a dependent dies. It simply states that the amount of time off should be reasonable. And there's no legal right for that time off to be paid. But often employers do pay for a period of time for their employee to take some time off. The law is a bit more specific with the death of a child. So employees have a right to two weeks off if their child dies under the age of 18 or is stillborn after 24 weeks of pregnancy. And this is what's known as parental bereavement leave and is also known as Jack's law. So parental bereavement leave is a day one right and it can be taken in the 56 weeks following the child's death. And during that, employees are also entitled to two weeks statutory parental bereavement pay if various conditions are met. And again, an employer might have its own bereavement policy offering more time off um, or more bereavement pay over and above the statutory minimum. But we must always remember that it cannot be less than the statutory minimum. I'm now going to hand over to Ruth to take you through the next couple of topics. Thanks, Lauren. So just before we discuss some practical tips and ideas to support good mental health and well-being in the workplace, let's take a quick look at the common telltale, telltale signs of poor mental health. Although it's worth pointing out, it's not always obvious and also it's important not to make assumptions. The sooner an employee does become aware of mental health problems, the sooner help and support can be provided. Some possible signs to look out for are appearing tired, anxious or withdrawn, increase in sickness absence or being late to work, changes in the standard of their work or focus on tasks, being less interested in tasks they previously enjoyed, changes in usual behaviour, mood or how the person behaves with the people that they work with. If an employer creates a safe and inclusive environment, it may encourage employees to talk more openly about mental health, which could help prevent problems from escalating. So, what can people do? The first thing I'll talk about is culture and awareness. Um, although, although things are getting better, there are still some common misunderstandings and a lack of greater knowledge surrounding mental health. Promoting an open culture and awareness of mental health in the workplace is really important. We want to encourage people to talk openly about mental health, and being able to voice when they feel that they need support. Allowing employees to feel comfortable to bring their whole self to work, by which we mean flaws and all. No one is perfect and we are likely to suffer from poor mental health at some stage of our lives. It's not a sign of weakness and it actually takes a strong person to say, I need some help. It can take some time to change an organisation's workplace culture, but here are a few suggestions that might help. Publicise commitment to promoting positive mental health, what help and support is available, where they can find the details and who can they talk to about it. Ensure all managers and team leaders lead by example. For example, leaving loudly, this will send a clear message of the importance of work-life balance and also showing their own vulnerabilities. Talk to staff or use a survey to find out about what the business is doing well and what they need to improve on. This will again show your commitment to supporting wellbeing and provide useful feedback. Doing all of these things will help normalise the subject so employees feel able to talk about talk to their managers, team leaders or colleagues, knowing that they'll be listened to, understood and supported. So now we'll talk about training. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence and Public Health England recommend that employers should consider the following when delivering training to the workforce. Information about mental wellbeing, how to identify early warning signs, any available resources, an awareness of the stigma associated with poor mental wellbeing, ongoing monitoring in the workplace, and how to have those conversations about well-being with an employee. Everyone at work has a responsibility when it comes to mental health and training should be tailored to suit their responsibilities. So let's have a look at a few of those responsibilities. HR, we're here to provide advice and support to managers and employees. We'll lead on reviewing employee well-being and monitoring sickness absence. However, some SMEs may find themselves without a HR department, which means these responsibilities will be split between senior leaders and the line managers. So the senior leaders, they are key to creating change, ensuring reliable processes are available and action plans to address any issues which are monitored and evaluated regularly. The line managers, they're responsible for overseeing their team's mental health on a day-to-day -day 
basis. They can use team meetings, regular one-to-ones, and seeking feedback from their teams on how they can improve. They should also be involved in promoting any initiatives. The employees, they're responsible for identifying any warning signs in themselves, seeking help when it's needed, and the management of their own mental health and well-being. So now let's look at mental health first aiders. There is an expectation for companies to have first aiders that deal with physical health. So why do we not have that same expectation to help with mental health? Mental health first aiders can contribute to discussions around mental health in the workplace and reducing that stigma that surrounds mental health. They can recognise those who, those who might be experiencing poor mental health and provide first level support by listening and signposting employees to legitimate sources of support and also escalating where it needs to be. However, it is important to note that they can't diagnose people. They're also not counsellors and they are not a replacement for proper treatment. So now let's look at financial wellbeing and employee assistance programmes. With the cost of living crisis still ongoing, financial wellbeing should be on every employer's agenda. However, the CIPD has shown there's currently a lack of attention on employees' financial wellbeing. A massive 47% of UK employees are worrying about money and two thirds of those who are struggling financially report at least one sign of poor mental health. And this can impact on their ability to function at work. Along with mental health, money health can be seen as a taboo topic, which can leave people to suffer in silence. Companies should promote conversations surrounding finances and the management of them. One place employers can seek financial advice for their employees are retirement plan providers. You've also got employee assistance programmes. These are a benefit provided, which can give employees 24 hour access to confidential support, professional advice, and short-term counselling to help deal with personal and work-related problems impacting their physical and mental health. The return on investment is quite high, and so it is a worthwhile investment. And some employees, employers without knowing it, have access to an EAP through their insurance schemes. Usage of EAPs was reported to be at 12% in 2022. So now let's look at occupational health. Occupational health is not just to be used when someone is off sick, but can be used for those who have identified that there might be an ongoing issue, which can be used as a preventative measure to ensure that as an employee, you are, employer, you are taking steps to prevent further decline. Occupational health experts may be able to support the individuals by signposting them to where they might seek further assistance, what might cause absence issues and provide insights into triggers, any adjustments that you might want to consider and whether the person may be covered under the Equality Act 2010 the length of time the adjustments may be required. You should note that you can't force an employee to attend an occupational health appointment, but it could be argued in some instances that this is a reasonable management request. Also, when managing the health of your employees, you can only give consideration to the information that, you're, that is available to you. Therefore, it's really beneficial to have an expert input as soon as possible. So now let's look at occupational sick pay. Government research shows that 28% of employee, employers provide occupational sick pay. Although when asked, 59% of employers agree there is a business case for providing it, which shows a bit of a contrast there. With 57% of people saying that finance is one of their top causes of stress and a proposed 23% of workers who would struggle to pay their bills or buy food within one week if they were to receive SSP or no pay at all, employers could ease this stress and worry by offering occupational sick pay. Presenteeism is a widespread problem. As Lauren mentioned before, with almost half of those surveyed reported in coming into work whilst feeling ill, these people are not productive whilst in work and they are potentially sicker for longer. And they can also spread their colds and viruses to other members of the workforce, further impacting productivity of their colleagues. Many companies are worried about their cost to the business. However, occupational sick pay can be a massive benefit to businesses in many ways when sickness absence is managed effectively. Now I'm going to talk about a policy. So obviously there is no legal requirement to have a sickness absence policy. However, we would always advocate for having a clear policy and procedure. You may question how exactly a policy supports good mental health. A policy can and should provide clarity in terms of expectations and support available. For example, how to report sickness absence, including who, to and by when. What evidence an employee needs to provide? Can they self-certify? Do they need a fit note? Entitlement to any occupational sick pay if it's offered and the process for managing both short-term and long-term sickness absence and the trigger points for those processes. So what if an employee is off sick with poor mental health? We've said that it always can't be avoided, so there will inevitably be times where an employee is off sick. So let's take a look at the things an employer can consider in this situation. 
So as we've already mentioned about a fit note, statements, statements for fitness for work, otherwise known as fit notes, are used to provide evidence of an employee's fitness for work. An employee may, may be assessed as not fit for work or may be fit for work taking account of advice, which could include a phased return, amended duties, altered hours or workplace adaptions. Since July 2022, fit notes can be issued by nurses, occupational therapists, pharmacists and physiotherapists, in addition to doctors. But remember, employees can self-certify for the first seven days. And if you as an employer require medical evidence for those first seven days, it will be your responsibility to arrange and pay for this. All the while the employee is not fit for work, they will need a valid fit note. This is even if they are no longer entitled to SSP or company sick pay. An employee can return to work before the expiry of their fit note. However, you should always take steps to ensure that it is appropriate and that the return won't worsen the employee's poor mental health, slow their recovery or put other employees at risk. This is perhaps a situation where carrying a risk assessment might be appropriate. So now let's look at statutory sick pay. To be eligible for statutory sick pay, a person must be classed as an employee and have done some work for the employer, earn an average of at least £123 per week before tax and have been ill for at least four days in a row. The entitlement to SSP lasts for up to 28 weeks of the year. An employee will not be entitled to SSP once this has been exhausted or if they're getting statutory maternity pay. The current rate of SSP is £109.40. You can't pay the employee less than this, but you can pay them over and above that rate if you wanted to offer occupational sick pay. So now let's look at communication. It is important if an employee is off sick with poor mental health to agree with them, how you will stay in touch, how often the contact will be, and how you will contact each other. So for example, is it by email, phone, or face-to-face -face meetings? Continuing to have contact is important as it can help both the employee stay informed and also keep the employer informed so that they can plan ahead. It can also allow the employer to assess what support the employee may need. But remember, it is important that the employee must not become overwhelmed. You should therefore allow the opportunity for the plan to be amended if it's no longer suitable. For example, an employee may have initially agreed to face-to-face -face contact, but are finding it overwhelming, so perhaps they may find a phone conversation would be suitable, a suitable alternative option. Now, just a quick reminder about also occupational health. We've mentioned that before, and we're all aware that occupational health is a good tool to help support an employee's mental health and well-being whilst they're at work, but it is also a really helpful tool when an employee is off sick, just from the perspective of what could be done to help them return to work and how to keep them in work in future. I'm now going to hand you back to Lauren to finish off the rest of today's content. Thanks, Ruth. So as much as we do try to get it right, obviously things do go and can go wrong. We therefore thought we'd finish off today by taking you through some of the potential claims that an employer could face. So the claim an employee brings will depend on a number of things, including whether the employer caused or was responsible for the employee's sickness due to mental ill health, whether the employee is classed as disabled under the Equality Act 2010, and whether the employer ultimately decides to dismiss the employee by reason of their incapacity or conduct in relation to their sickness absence for mental ill health. It's worthwhile to note that there's no standalone claim called breach of duty of care or breach of trust and confidence. Obviously, we mentioned the implied duties earlier on. However, there are likely to be other legal claims for situations where an employer breaches these duties. For example, a breach of contract or perhaps a constructive dismissal if there's a really serious breach. So we're going to touch upon personal injury, disability discrimination, and that includes reasonable adjustments and unfair dismissal. So for personal injury, if the employer caused or was responsible for the employee's sickness absence, it could amount to a personal injury claim. This obviously falls under the remit of our personal injury colleagues, but in brief, an employer may be liable under the tort of negligence by failing to exercise reasonable care to prevent personal injury, potentially health and safety legislation for not providing a safe system of work, Failure to provide a suitable working environment, which is an implied contractual duty, which is broader than the health and safety duty. An implied duty not to act without reasonable and proper cause and in a manner calculated or likely to destroy the relationship of trust and confidence. 
and discrimination and harassment if their illness has been caused or exasperated by unlawful discrimination, victimisation or harassment. So with disability discrimination, by law, again, the Equality Act 2010, somebody with poor mental health can be considered to be disabled if it has a substantial adverse effect on their life. For example, they regularly cannot focus on a task or it takes them longer to complete tasks. It lasts or is expected to last at least 12 months and it affects their ability to do their normal day-to-day -day activities. For example, interacting with people, following instructions or keeping to set working times. And it's really important to note that poor mental health can be considered a disability even if the employee does not have symptoms all of the time. So in some cases it may be obvious if the employee is disabled but in other cases it might be necessary or prudent to obtain a medical report on a particular employee in order to make this assessment or to consider the extent of any reasonable adjustments that might be required. In borderline cases, many employers simply proceed on the basis of an assumption that the employee is disabled. And if an employee is disabled, which is one of the nine protected characteristics because of poor mental health, employers must be very careful to avoid the following. So direct discrimination, which is treating them less favorably because of a disability. Discrimination arising from a disability, so treating them unfavorably because of something arising out of their disability, unless that treatment is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Indirect discrimination, so that's applying a provision, criterion or practice, otherwise known as a PCP, that puts an employee and any other person with that same disability at a particular disadvantage, unless that PCP again is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Failure to make reasonable adjustments where these would help overcome a substantial disadvantage. And this is a duty that's unique to the protected characteristic of disability. A victimization, so dismissing or subjecting an employee to detriment because they have done a protected act, which could be complaining about discrimination or perhaps supporting another employee in their complaint. And finally, harassment. So the unwanted conduct related to disability which has the purpose or effect of violating that employee's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment for them. And it's really important to note that there is no minimum qualifying period for discrimination claims and there's also no upper limit on compensation. And that will usually include an award for injury to feelings and that may anticipate a prolonged period out of the workforce. So reasonable adjustments. It's always a good idea to work with an employee to make the right adjustments for them, even if you don't think their mental ill health amounts to a disability. Quite often, simple changes to the person's working arrangements or responsibilities could be enough to help prevent sickness absence owing to poor mental health. So, for example, just allowing them to take more rest breaks or working with them each day to help them prioritise their workload. In theory, the scope of possible reasonable adjustments is almost limitless. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, the EHRC, has an employment statutory code of practice which contains a non-exhaustive list of examples, as well as factors that might be taken into account in deciding whether a particular adjustment is reasonable in any given case. A copy of the statutory code of practice is available for you to download from the EHRC website and the link is on the slides. So unfair dismissal, qualifying employees, by which we mean those with over two years continuous service, have the right not to be unfairly dismissed. An employer can defend a claim of unfair dismissal successfully if they can establish that the reason for the dismissal is one of five potentially fair reasons, and they include capability, conduct, and some other substantial reason, otherwise known as SOSR. And of course, the tribunal concludes that the reason for the dismissal was fair in all of the circumstances. So capability, that is a potentially fair reason for dismissal where it relates to the capability of the employee for performing work of the kind for which they were employed to do. And capability here means an employee's capability assessed by reference to skill, aptitude, health and any other physical or mental quality. 
with conduct, so persistent unauthorised absences that may give rise to a conduct dismissal if no valid reason is given for the absence, or the employer's sickness absence reporting procedure is breached, which is why, as Ruth mentioned earlier, policies can be quite important. Malingering, for example, may also give rise to a dismissal due to conduct. And then finally, SOSR, that could be, for example, short-term intermittent absences, even if they are for genuine ill health reasons, that could give rise to an SOSR dismissal if they have a significant detrimental impact on the employer's business and the employee's performance. And when dismissing an employee on the grounds of capability conduct or SOSR, it's important that the employer acts reasonably. This means that the employer must follow a fair procedure and the principles governing procedural fairness in cases of dismissal for genuine ill health are those established by case law. So the leading case on fairness in ill health dismissals made clear that the employer should establish the true medical position and consult with the employee before deciding whether to dismiss. And that was the case of East Lindsay District Council against Daubney. In the vast majority of cases, the Daubney guidelines will apply. However, the position may differ with regard to, with regard to short term intermittent absences. But the following factors are likely to be relevant when considering the reasonableness of the decision to dismiss. So the nature of the employee's illness, the prospects of the employee returning to work and the likelihood of the reoccurrence of the illness, the need for the employer to have somebody doing the work, the effect of the absences on the rest of the workforce, the extent to which the employee was made aware of the position and the employee's length of service. So that does uh, conclude the content for today's webinar. We hope that you found it useful. Um, obviously, we've whizzed through quite a fair amount today. Um, but as I mentioned at the very beginning, there is going to be a recording of this webinar um, and it will be available on our website shortly. So you can download a copy um, of that and the slides uh, from our website. Um, looking at the time, unfortunately, we have run out of time to answer any questions. But obviously, if you do need any help of, or advice, whether that be of a HR or legal nature, then please do not hesitate to contact us. Our next webinar will be delivered by Colin Smith um, alongside Diversity HR. And that's next week on the 17th of October. And the topic for that will be the employment law update. So if you'd like to attend that webinar, the link for it will be included on the follow up email that you'll receive after today's webinar. Or again, you can sign up via our website um, and we'll also be holding another Braces Bite Size webinar in November and details of that will be circulated in due course. So just remains for me to say thank you all very much for attending. As I say, we hope that you found it useful and you've got some good, useful hints and tips to help you um, in your business. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks very much.